Hello, this is Foz Meadows. I'm speaking to you from California where it is lovely and sunny and that makes not being able to go outside all the more painful. So <laughs> welcome to this uh, quarantine solidarity live reading event. Um, I'm going to mumble along for a little bit just to give people some time to join the stream before we start. Um, what I was thinking I would do is I would read the first chapter of my novel, An Accident of Stars. And having done that, if we've got a bit of time and a bit of interest, I thought I might read a little bit of a work in progress that I've got going at the moment. So, <sighs> this is a weird time to be living in. And, oh, I should say at some point there is a non-zero chance of me being interrupted either by a cat or by a small child. So if that happens, I ask for your forbearance and indulgence. Um, okay, so without further ado, well, maybe a little bit of further ado. I don't really know how to tell if anyone's watching, but I'm just going to work on the assumption that eventually people will show up. And if not, then it's just me passing time talking to myself, which is more or less the default anyway. <laughs> uh, so, okay. An Accident of Stars. This is a portal fantasy and the protagonist, well, you'll find out because I'm going to read from the very first chapter. So, this is from a duology, by the way, which is complete. So, here we go. Chapter one. Sarcasm is armor, Saffron thought, and imagined she was donning a suit of it, plate by gleaming, snark laden plate. Nice undies, leered Jared Blake, lifting her skirt with a ruler. No, not a ruler. It was a metal file, one of the heavy ones they were meant to be using on their metalworking projects. He grinned at her unrepentant and poked the file upwards. The cold iron rasped against her thigh. You shaved? Fuck off, Jared, Saffron shot back. I'd rather have sex with an octopus. He ooed at her, a ridiculous noise meant to ridicule. Giving her hem a final upwards flick, he retracted the file and pulled a face for the benefit of his laughing friends, then loudly yelled to the teacher, Sir, Mr Yarra, Saffron said fuck, sir. Mr Yarra turned with the lumbering, angry slowness of a provoked bear. He was a big man, block solid and bald, a stereotypical metal, worker ex metal work teacher, except for the fact that he mostly talk art, taught art and was only filling in for Mrs Kirkland. He pointed a fat, calloused finger at Jared, then jerked his thumb at the doorway. Out! Jared mimed comic disbelief as his friends kept laughing. But sir, I didn't do anything, sir. It was saffron. Mr Yarris didn't take the bait. Out! He said again, folding his arms. Jared dramatically flung down the file. This is bullshit, he said. I didn't... Out! roared Mr Yarris, loud enough that even Jared flinched. But the effect was spoiled when, seconds later, the bell rang for lunch. As Jared leapt from his stool, Saffron pointedly kicked her bag into his path. His sneakers tangled in the straps and down he went with a crash. Oops, said Saffron, loud and flat so the whole class knew that she'd done it on purpose. My mistake. And before Mr Yaris could pause what had happened, she reached down, yanked the bag back from Jared and stormed out of class. She was furious, shaking all over as she sped away from metalwork rooms. How dare he? How dare he? Nitty did dare, publicly and often, to whichever girl was nearest. Nobody stopped it. Nobody even came close. He'd been suspended last year for groping a Year 7 girl in the canteen lines, but once he returned, he was just as bad as ever, snapping bras, making sick comments, and bullying Maddie Shen so badly. He stole her bag, opened her sanitary pads, and stuck them over her books and folders, all while calling her names. But Saffron had later found her having a panic attack in the bathroom. He was awful and got up to even worse at parties, but as appalling as Jared's behaviour was, Lawson High apparently considered unrelenting sexual harassment to be insufficient grounds for expulsion. Boys will be boys, the deputy head had said, the one time Saffron had screwed up the nerve to approach him about it. Or should I expel them all just to be on the safe side? And then he'd laughed, like the fact that the problem was so widespread was funny. Saffron came to a halt. She was outside the music rooms and the air was filled with the yells and the shrieks and laughter and profanity of lunchtime. She leaned her head on the rough red bricks and fought back tears. I can't keep doing this anymore. I can't. But she had to. What other choice was there? As Gwen saw it, the first rule of interacting with teenagers was simple, show no fear. 
Given its general applicability, it was also her personal motto, and one that had served her well in the decades since she'd first stumbled into the multiverse and out of what she'd grown up thinking was normal. Human adolescents, she reminded herself, were not more terrifying than magical politics in walking between worlds. You can do this. You have to. She could took a deep breath and stepped into Lawson High. In Kenna, where magic was ubiquitous, you could open a portal damn near anywhere. On Earth, however, things were somewhat trickier. The way Trishka explained it, which was, in fairness to Gwen's comprehension, vaguely, some places were simply less accessible than others, resisting the touch of the Jahudimet, the portal magic, like a knot that wouldn't pull loose. But even once you found a receptive location, you could only use it so many times in succession. The more you ripped a particular patch of reality's fabric in any world, the higher the risk it would start to unravel, and Gwen had no desire to cause an international incident. With her previous portal point thus ruled out, Trishka had gone in search of a suitable substitute and come up with a patch of bush alongside the local high school. If they'd had more time, Gwen would have protested. The last thing she wanted to risk was an accidental audience. But they didn't, and she hadn't, and now she was here, striding across the playground at what was evidently lunchtime, and trying not to look as conspicuous as she felt. She had a cover story, of course. If anyone asked, she was looking the campus over before applying for a job in the understaffed English faculty. The fact that Gwen had, once upon a time, actually qualified as a teacher meant she could probably bluff her way through an adult conversation should the need arise. The greater risk, as ever, was the curiosity of children. As a flock of shrieking tweens dashed haphazardly past, Gwen suppressed a smile and fought the urge to light up a cigarette, which was bound to attract the wrong sort of attention. Just get across campus, find the place and wait, she told herself. And then she saw the girl. She was white, about 16, long-boned and lanky, though her hunched shoulders said she was self-conscious about it. Gwen, who was tall and grown up hating it, could sympathise. Her eyes were green, made prominent by the near-black circles beneath them, while her blonde hair, a natural shade, Gwen judged, hung messily to her shoulders. She was standing by a wall with a bag at her feet, her expression so nakedly lost it was clear she didn't know she had an audience. Gwen twisted a little to see it, but if not for what happened next, she might still have kept walking. A rangy white boy came storming up from around the corner, yelling at the girl. He was all raw angles and sharp bones, like he was trying to grow into his body faster than it would let him, and the hooked smile on his face had no friendliness in it. What the fuck is your problem? He shouted, pushing her. You stupid bitch, get off me, the girl snarled, shoving him away, or trying to at least. The boy hung onto her arm with hard, thin fingers, and before she could stop herself, Gwen closed the distance between them. Smiling furiously, she grabbed the boy's wrist, pinching just so to make him give up his grip on the girl, and twisted his arm up behind his back. He yelped, first in shock and then in pain, swearing as he struggled. What the fuck, lady? Gwen tightened her grip. Say uncle, she said, and looked straight at the girl, who was staring at her with a mixture of hope and hunger, as if the world had just completely rearranged itself. Flailing, the boy tried to pull free. Gwen responded by tugging his arm up higher, harder. Say uncle, boy. Uncle, uncle, fuck! Gwen counted to three, then shoved him roughly away. He staggered, turned and stared at her, incredulous in his anger. The is wrong with you? And before she could answer, he darted away like a rat from a trap, leaving Gwen alone with the unknown girl, who licked her lips and said softly, thanks. Does he bother you often? The girl snorted. He bothers everything in a skirt. Are you new here, miss? I haven't seen you before. I may be applying for a job, Gwen said, though I doubt I'll get it. I hope you do. The girl's jaw ticked. No one else ever stops him. Anger washed through Gwen. She'd already stayed too long, made too much of an impression, but she couldn't bring herself to leave just yet. Well, they should, she said, and winced at the inadequacy of the words. What's your name, girl? Saffron, she said, clearly surprised by the question. Saffron Coulter. Well, Saffron Coulter, let me give you some unsolicited advice, said Gwen, because having already come this far, she might as well go that little bit further. Then faltered at the realisation that there wasn't much she could say. She didn't know what else was going on in Saffron's life, and the boy's harassment of her wasn't going to stop just because Gwen had literally twisted his arm. What could she possibly say that might make a difference? Yeah, said Saffron expectantly. What? Gwen sighed. Life is hard. Some days we get our asses kicked, but apathy breeds more evils than defeat. So, you know, keep fighting. It was, Gwen thought, a shitty speech. Pix would probably laugh until she cried. But the girl Saffron lit up as though she'd never heard anything better. Thank you, she said again, quieter than before, but also stronger. For the first time, she stood at her full height. I'll try. Good, said Gwen, and with a parting clap to Saffron's shoulder, she strode away in search of a magic door. Happy through breeds more evils than defeat. Keep fighting. Saffron couldn't get the words or the encounter out of her head, which made no sense. It wasn't as if she'd never had to deal with Jared grabbing her before, not like she'd ever even needed the help to get rid of him, however satisfying its delivery had been. 
And it wasn't like she didn't know the world was a messed up place either. You only had to look at the news to see that much. But she'd never had an adult acknowledge the fact to her face, let alone so bluntly, and especially not when it came to the predations of Jared Blake. Whoever the teacher was, she'd done more to make Saffron feel capable, safe and validated in the space of one conversation than either her parents or her teachers had since the start of term, and all at once she didn't know whether she wanted to laugh or cry. When the bell rang for the end of lunch, she felt like she'd been jolted out of a stupor. She hadn't touched her food. Suddenly the prospect of going straight to class was intolerable. Shouldering her bag, Saffron cut across campus and headed straight for the second floor entrance to the library, which was built on a slope against the old English block. Once inside, she hid behind the new arrivals shelf until she was sure that none of the librarians were watching, then moved quietly over to the emergency door. It was meant to be alarmed, but as she'd learned accidentally after falling against it a few months back, it wasn't. For obvious reasons, it wasn't locked either, not during the day anyway, and Saffron slipped through with unobtrusive ease. On the other side was a small square landing stuck between two flights of stairs, one going down to the ground level exit and one that led up to the roof. Saffron took the latter option, leaping up two steps at a time. The roof door was unlocked by virtue of being broken. The lock and handle had both been hacked clean out of the wood and now it only stayed shut because the cleaning staff kept a heavy chalk wedged under the frame. Saffron opened the door, used the wedge to pin it up against the wall so it didn't bang in the breeze and headed out into the sunlight. The accessible section of roof was hemispherical, bordered by a waist-high brick wall, just high enough to hide her from casual scrutiny. To one side was a fat square vent, and on the other, protected by a broad awning, was a locked metal cupboard at whose mysterious contents Saffron could only guess. Beside it were two plastic chairs, set facing each other under the overhang, and as had become her custom, she sat down in one and propped her feet on the other, head tipped back against the sun-warmed metal. The first time she'd skipped class to come to the roof, she'd been equal parts angry and terrified. Angry because the deputy head had just given her the boys will be boys speech, and she had no, could no more have sat through maths after that than flown to the moon. And terrified because up until that moment, she'd never cut class in her life. She'd been shaking, so certain that someone was going to shout her out or stop her, that when she made it up without incident, she'd spend a full five minutes staring at the open door, convinced that someone was following. But nobody came. And when she showed up to her next lesson, it was like she'd never been gone. Friends or faculty, if anyone had missed her, they didn't mention it. It was like a revelation, as though she'd spent years preemptively flinching from someone who, it turned out, either couldn't or wouldn't hit her. Since then, she'd grown incrementally bolder, coming up more frequently and for longer. She had a half dozen excuses worked out to explain her absence from class in the event that anyone ever asked where she'd been, but so far she hadn't had to use any of them. Now she shut her eyes and exhaled deeply, savouring the luxury of privacy and silence as over and over again she replayed what had happened. Apathy breeds more evils than defeat. Keep fighting. Saffron stayed on the roof for two full periods, only going to her last class of the day for the sake of appearances. appearances. As she walked, she found herself surreptitiously glancing around in hopes of spying her rescuer again. She wasn't exactly inconspicuous. Where Lawson High's teaching staff was almost uniformly white, the unknown woman was not. Her brown skin was warm and weathered, and when she spoke, her rich smoke gravel voice was coloured by a faint English accent, marking her as doubly incongruous to Saffron's suburban Australian sensibilities. She'd been tall too, almost six feet, with kinky iron-grey hair cut to jaw length, and when she'd held Jared still, the muscles in her arms had stood out like cords. Such a woman, where she's still on campus, should have attracted attention. But though Saffron looked, she didn't see her. And though she listened to her classmates talk, she didn't overhear anything that pointed to her presence. The portal point turned out to be a nature strip. Technically, it was part of the school grounds, but happily for Gwen, it was right at the outskirts and, better still, deserted. True, there were some classrooms nearby, but most of their windows were on the other side of the building, leaving the strip in a convenient blind spot. Now all she had to do was wait. Gwen hated waiting. Irritable with unspent energy, she sat down on a tree stump and tried to remind herself why it was she'd left Kenner in the first place. With Tevet dead and the rebellion with her, Gwen and her allies had lost their best shot at removing Leoden from power. They'd needed to lie low, regroup, and after a solid year away from Earth, Gwen had taken the opportunity to accomplish both tasks while proving to her parents, who'd retired to Australia years ago, that she was in fact still alive. Such reunions were always bittersweet, complex. None of her relatives or remaining friends had any idea how she lived her life, which made the act of lying to them more chore than holiday. And yet she was glad to have visited, if only because it left her that much happier to return to her dangerous, wonderful reality. She'd kept in contact with Trishka through the dreamscape, however patchily, and now at last she was going back to help fix the mess she'd made. Those were the facts, but just at the moment they didn't stop her from feeling as if she'd slunk off with her tail between her legs. 
Guilt, after all, was the rightful province of people who'd had a hand in ruining whole countries, whether they'd meant it or not. Rationality didn't enter into it. Her lips quirked in private irony. Her son, were he privy to her thoughts, would doubtless see things differently. But Dan Lewis had chosen a life stranger even than Gwen's. And though she loved him dearly, she didn't always understand him, which was doubtless true of most parents, for all that she'd raised him in somewhat exceptional circumstances, even by the standards of the many. What had she? Certainly Louis himself had seen nothing unusual in it, and if he harboured any resentment on that point, he'd never brought it up. Not for the first time, Gwen wondered if children, even when grown, weren't inherently more complex than the multiverse, and decided, now as always, that some questions were better left unanswered. Like water flowing downstream, her thoughts turned from Louis towards the white girl, Saffron, and that parting look of gratitude on her face. Helping her in the moment had been easy, but as with so much else, Gwen hadn't really changed anything. That awful boy would likely still continue to bother her, and the school's apparent indifference to the problem would persist. I was still right to help. It was a small comfort, but against the looming weight of Leoden's coup and Kenna's complexities, Gwen would take what victories she could find. Sighing, Saffron put her head on her desk and stared sideways at the clock. Her last class of the day was personal development, health and physical education, also known as PDHPE, also known as a complete and utter waste of time, partly because she'd be dropping it next year, but mostly because the kind of sex education deemed suitable for state school students was vastly less accurate, detailed or relevant than anything she couldn't find on one of a half dozen sex positive YouTube channels run by people who, unlike Mr. Marinakis, could say penis without twitching. I need to find her, Saffron thought. I need to say, well, not thank you, because she'd already said that, but something. She wanted to explain herself or ask the woman's advice or maybe just spend five minutes in the company of an adult who might actually take her seriously. It was irrational and pointless and she couldn't stop thinking about it. And when the last bell finally rang, she ended up walking towards the bus lines in a virtual fugue state. Saff, hey, wait up. Saffron stopped and turned, smiling as her little sister Ruby came running over. Didn't you hear me? Ruby asked, glaring. I had to call you like five times. Well, I'm hearing you now. What's up? They started walking together, Ruby launching straight into a lengthy description of her day. But as much as Saffron usually enjoyed her sister's acid observations about high school life, she couldn't quite focus. She was only half listening, still scanning the school for the mystery teacher. So I told her, look, this isn't a Monty Python sketch. There aren't any strange women lurking in the nature strip. And then she said, what? Said Saffron, suddenly jerking back to the moment. She stopped, a hand on Ruby's arm. What about strange women? Ruby rolled her eyes. God, you really don't listen, do you? I literally just said Cora was convinced there was some random lady hanging out in the nature strip behind the Ken Labs all the afternoon, and I just, hey, where are you going? Forgot something, Saffron said, already moving off. Remembering that she'd left her phone charging in her bedroom, she turned and added, tell mum and dad I'll be home later, okay? Tell them yourself, Ruby called, but Saffron didn't answer. Heart pounding, she made her way across campus, trying and failing to explain to herself why on earth it's felt so important. Or why, more to the point, she felt so damn certain that the woman Cora claimed to have seen was her mystery teacher. What the hell are you hoping to accomplish here, she asked herself. School's over, dumbass. Even if she was there earlier, she'll be long gone by now. And yet she kept walking, ignoring the awkward tug in her chest that said she should just go back to the bus lines. She passed the science block, turned the corner and stopped. There, standing in the middle of the nature strip, was the mystery teacher. She was side on to Saffron, but unaware of her presence, head cocked as though listening for something. Saffron licked her lips and stepped closer, too concerned with trying to think of what to say to question why the woman was there at all. And then it happened. Scarcely three metres from where the teacher stood, a crack appeared in the world, a gaping pink tear in reality's flank, scything through the naked air like some sort of impossible portal. It almost hurt to look at, and as Saffron gulped and thought, it's real, I'm seeing this and it's really real, her whole body went weak with shock, the way it had done last year when a clumsy driver had knocked her off her bike. Her blood was alive with panic, fear, excitement. What should she do? What should they do? And only then did she see that the teacher was smiling, striding towards the gap as though its presence was the most natural thing on earth. In the split second before the teacher crossed the portal's threshold, Saffron made a decision. All she could think of was that she wanted to talk to her, and now she was escaping, moving through a hole in the world that had no business existing anywhere, let alone in a nature strip behind the chem labs. And so, in her shock, she did the only thing she could think of. Saffron ran forwards and followed her through the gap. And that is the end of chapter one, Accident of Stars. If you would like to know more of it, you can check it out maybe. <laughs> um, all right, so that took about 15 odd minutes. So I'll kill another 15 
and I'm going to read not a full chapter but the start of a work in progress that I have going which is uh, tentatively titled at this point The Janus Game and this is a sort of weird science fiction <laughs> story. I don't quite know how to characterise it. Um, also you can probably see from my hair at the moment that uh, I haven't been able to go to a hairdresser in a while. This is the uh, this is the Garfield years stage of my of my hair growing it out. So um, if I look like a bit like a weird woolly cat, that's uh, that's not intentional. I'm not under the impression that this actually looks good. This is this is just what happens at this particular stage of growth. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. This is the start of the Janus game. Uh, as I said, this is a work in progress. So um, hopefully it will be eventually somewhere finished and available for purchase, but I don't know where or when that would be, but this is just some fun. So, oh, sorry. The ship was nearly out of fuel and Vian was out of ideas. He'd known all along he didn't have enough to get him safely to Kiona, but he'd declared that future Vian's problem and set off regardless. Only now he was future Vian, and he still hadn't figured it out. A reproving beep echoed through the borrowed ship, followed by a curt reiteration of the same warning message he'd already heard a dozen times, and would doubtless hear a dozen more before the reserves ran dry. I know, I know, Vian hissed at the console. I'm thinking! The ship, which had no anima, didn't answer. It was a mid-range skipper, good for jaunts between moons and the odd foray further out, provided you had a good map of the nearest fuel docks, but Vian had taken it well beyond those bounds. He stared at the nav screen, heart twisting with frustrated hope at how seemingly close his destination was. Kiona was right there, the main Q Confederacy spaceport at Rixi, barely 30 keys away, but his fuel supply was only sufficient to travel another five, which meant he couldn't usefully go anywhere else either. He slumped in the pilot's seat, running a hand down his face. He'd turned on his emergency beacon as soon as he jumped to the yaw of Kion space, but he was on the wrong axis of approach for the bulk of Kionar bound traffic, especially at this point in calendar, and the ship's beacon was short range only. He could have jumped nearer the primary ship lanes in hope of a quicker rescue, but it would have cost him more fuel, and drifting there would have put him at dangerous risk of collision. He forced himself to acknowledge the truth of it, hands twitching over the console. The yaw was safer. You made the right choice. Or well, the best one available, anyway. Survival wasn't the problem. He had enough air, food, and water to subsist comfortably in the ship until someone found him once enough time had passed and he had drifted a key or two close to the key or nah. But time, like fuel, was a resource Vian didn't have to spare, not unless he wanted this whole stupid journey to be for nothing. Arriving three days from now would be as pointless as if he'd never left Tathika Station, and Vian hadn't gone to the trouble of seducing Nojas Bakri to give up with the draft in sight. His lips quirked in white, wry remembrance. No, Jess might have been a pragmatic fuck, all things considered, but that happily hadn't prevented him from being an enjoyable one, too. Warning, fuel reserves low. Please reduce speed to prolong supply or refill auxiliary reservoir. Remaining range at current speed, four keys. Vian gave an inarticulate growl, spinning in his chair to keep from taking his frustration out on the console. The ship was one of the tinier models fitted with jump tech, and Vian was not a small man. The sudden movement banged his knee hard into the edged wall, and though it didn't really hurt, he took it as an excuse to swear with gusto. When he was done, he spun more slowly, contemplating the gleaming interior. Thanks to Nojas, the ship was in pristine condition and well stocked with both delicacies, to which Vian had long since helped himself, and emergency supplies, which he hadn't. The onboard entertainment options were... Well, in fairness, very tasteful examples of that particular art, but not exactly conducive to helping him out of his current predicament. The ship boasted one lavish bedroom, which he'd already explored in full, an intimate seating area alongside a shield port, the better for viewing the wonders of space and comfort. The whole thing was a happy marriage of extravagance and practicality, and now that he knew Nojas to be, if not a bedroom savant, then certainly more than adequate, Vian was half regretting not having taken him up on his offer sooner. Practicality, that was the thing. At no conscious cue from Vian, his gaze flicked to a sleek, unobtrusive cabinet fitted against the far wall. He already knew what it contained. Nojas had made certain to point out all the safety features prior to his departure. But his pulse sped up as he finally let himself consider it an alternative. No, he said. After a moment, he stood up and walked to the cabinet anyway. Pressing his rough brown palm to the smooth white door, he said, a trifle more firmly, This is a very bad idea. Vian opened the door. He looked at the spacesuit hung within. The fuel warning sounded again. He had three keys of range left now. Softly and with feeling, Vian said, Fuck. He stood there staring at the spacesuit for as much time as it took for the ship to burn through another key's length of fuel and tell him about it. 
Am I really doing this? He asked aloud. Silence. Bian closed his eyes and imagined having to go back to Tafika Station. Fuck, he said again. He put the spacesuit on. The yaw was everywhere, above, below, beside, around, a vast expanse of black broken only by distant pinprick stars and the close yet unreachable curve of Kionar and its moons. Bian had spacewalked before and more than once. It was practically a rite of passage for every newcomer to the Tafika Ions, but never so far out, let alone unanchored. It was dizzying, terrifying, exhilarating. He used his prop jet sparingly, allowing himself a quick burst of speed, then drifting until he slowed. He'd done what he could to maximise his chances of being found quickly. Aside from attaching the ship's short-range beacon to the suit, which was only sensible, he'd taken his initial leap into space when the ship itself was still moving, letting its momentum pro pro him, propel him further and faster than the suit could manage on its own, which also meant he had no way back. Vian shuddered all over, forcing a grin as he jetted forwards again. They'll find you. Someone will find you. The yaw was silent, vast and cold, and utterly inhospitable to his fragile human body. Aside from his eye dent and omnic, the few possessions he'd brought with him from Tathika were back on the ship. Even a little extra weight would cost valuable fuel to move, and Vian was already gambling big. The black pressed in against him, even as it receded, leaving him suspended in nothingness. He was overly aware of his own breath, loud in the confines of his helmet. Should have put some music through the comm, he thought, shivering just a little. The long braid of his hair tucked awkwardly down the back of the suit alternately rustled and pinched if he turned his head too quickly, which in turn made him overly conscious of moving at all. Even Forward's drift felt exaggerated. He had only one line of sight to go on to get him closer to Kiwana, and while he rationally knew it wasn't possible for him to overshoot, he didn't have anywhere near enough fuel to put him at risk of that. He didn't want to waste any distance zigzagging either. According to the safety notes, the suit itself had somewhere between four and six keys of range, depending on how much weight it was being asked to move, and a carbon cycling system that used Starmos to transmute his sweat and exhaled breath into breathable air. On paper, that meant he couldn't run out of oxygen so long as the moss kept functioning, even once his tank ran dry. In practice, as even Vian knew, the moss's rate of production, while constant, was nonetheless far slower than his own carbon dioxide output. Once his tank emptied, the air would grow thinner and harder to breathe the longer he had to depend on it, until his body lapsed into self-preserving unconsciousness. Unconsciousness is fine, he reminded himself, trying very hard not to panic. It's only the possible coma and death that's the problem. He jetted forwards again, thumbing the controls more sharply than intended, and swore as his fumbling jabbed him off course. He corrected, palms sweat slippy inside his gloves, and still Kianar appeared no closer. His sister's voice, sardonic and practical, sounded in his head. Is the draft worth dying for, Vian? Really dying? Shut up, Sria, he thought back, a manic bubble of laughter popping on his lips. You study giant animals, dangerous animals, you know nothing. More than you do, hockey boy. Staring out into the black, Vian whispered, maybe so. Hours passed, or what felt like hours. He'd checked the suit's readout once early on and had no desire to duplicate the surge of terrifying nausea brought on by tangible proof of how little distance he'd covered. Travelling keys in a ship was one thing. Attempting the same distance in a suit alone was quite another. Too late, Vian realised he'd effectively trapped himself in a sort of sensory deprivation experience or something perilously close to it without a clear exit strategy. He had a sudden bizarre flashback to one of his Genskill school modules, how early spacefaring humans had debated whether fear of the void was agoraphobia or claustrophobia before deciding that actually the terror of space was unique. The proper term came to him in his father's voice, chthonophobia, derived from some three times ancient word for the underworld. Not underworld, he thought wildly, staring at distant Kiwana. Overworld, far world, stuck between world. The beacon he carried had a range of seven keys. He'd left the ship some 25 keys from the planet and must surely have covered at least another two since then, which meant he ought to be broadcasting well within range of someone. And all the while he was drifting closer, all the while his chances of being found and soon were rising. The suit beeped, his wrist panel flashing once in the darkness. He was nearly out of air. Ordinarily, Vian wasn't much given to panic. He panicked now, hyperventilating as he fought the urge to kick and flail and scream as if doing so might somehow serve a purpose. Shutting his eyes was terrifying. It left him even more alone without even a sense of scale or trajectory by which to reckon his place in the universe. The suit beeped again as his tank ran empty, leaving him wholly dependent on moss-made air. The voice in his head became his own, excoriating and trapped. You absolute luck-sunk idiot. You couldn't have found a single other way to get off Tathika. Even with Glade and blocking you, surely you could have charmed one captain, bribed one ship to get you to the draft. But oh no, that was too risky. Too many elements beyond your control. So why the fuck did you get in the spacesuit, Arsbrain? 
Staves was right. She was fucking right. You always have to go that little bit bigger than everyone else, don't you? Try the fancier play, the riskier shot, never mind the context. Well, this is what happens when you leap without looking one too many times. You absolute hack. Something moved in the dark, a far-off speck that no sooner gleamed than vanished. Vian froze, pulse juddering as he tried and failed to identify whatever it was, or had he imagined it? He was breathing more shallowly now, a faint fog of condensation beating on the inside of his visor. Reflexively, he raised a hand to wipe it clear and succeeded only in smacking himself in the helmet. Shaking a little at the mishap, he moved to jet himself forwards again, only for the suit to give a final lurching burst of momentum and then beep to announce its lack of fuel. Vian sucked in a breath of wet, thin air. I'm fine. This is fine. It wasn't fine. Vian lasted another 30 seconds, hyperventilating all the while before, pardon, before he screamed, the pitch and reverberation painfully loud in his ears. He felt himself gasping, coloured spots swimming in his vision. He laughed harshly, terrified and furious, and just a smidge bitterly satisfied that his dying out here would at least see Gladen well and truly fucked because Vian should never have been forced to take such a dangerous risk in the first place. He passed out. Flashes of consciousness followed, dark, bright, dark. A lolling sensation, like being reluctantly hauled from a too hot bath. His fingers twitched in his glove, abortive and useless. Sound. Was that sound? A friction of motion. Up, 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 and then his drifting weightlessness was suddenly harshly, rudely replaced with gravity. Vian dropped face down from an unknown height onto hard, flat metal, spasming as his empty lungs ached, and then he was manhandled onto his back, flopping ungracefully over as unknown fingers opened his visor. Air. Sweet air. He coughed and breathed and drank it in, eyes squeezed shut against the light. A thump beside him, as of a kneeling person sitting back on their calves, followed by an incredulous noise. Yamaya's breath, boy, a woman said in Erogen. What in the name of good sense are you doing out here? The aunt spasmed with laughter, flailing a hand in the vague direction of his pocketed eye dent and omnic. Hockey, he gasped, throat raw with relief. I'm Vianule Startler from the Tathaga Ions. I'm here for the QHL draft on Kionar. And then he passed out. When Vian came to, drive-mouthed and shaky with residual adrenaline, he found himself sprawled on the standard ship's bunk with a pair of novelty antlers stuck to his head. He pawed confusedly at them as he sat up. He'd been stripped of the spacesuit, but not his clothes, blinked, stared at the shiny pink tines in his hand, and wondered if he was having some kind of seizure. Sorry, said a cheerfully unsorry voice, both warmer and lighter than the one he'd heard before. He turned towards the speaker, blinked again, and found himself facing a short, curvy woman of about 30 standard, her kinky hair done up in knots and a beaming smile on her face. Um, said Vian eloquently. The woman's grin broadened. Our home point is Corazon on Nieves. Go hearts! Tathika Station orbited Nieves. In the past two years, Vian had played close to a dozen games in front of crowds replete with antlers, just like the ones he was holding. He'd been rescued by hockey fans. Rival hockey fans. He heard Sriya's voice in his head again, thick with sibling disgust. You absolute ass of a brother. You're so goddamn ridiculous lucky. It makes me sick. Tackle Vian looked at his saviour, belatedly noticing the omnic clutched in her hand. You took photos of me, he asked, brain clicking into gear, wearing Corazon antlers. I did indeed, she said. I haven't put them on uplink yet, though. I wanted to make sure you were really all right first. We had Medbay check you out, but you never know. And then, belatedly, I'm Yoko, by the way, and this, she waved her omnic to indicate the ship, is Peregrine. We're a few keys out from Kionar, and the Port Authority nearly had a fit when we said we had you on board. Apparently they've been taking bets on when and how you'd show up, and I don't think they had this down as an option. I'd hope not, Vian muttered. I certainly didn't. He coughed, half because his lungs still hurt and half from embarrassment, and added with a sincerity that slipped out by accident, thank you, though, for saving me. Yoko looked pleased with herself in a way that was somehow a thousand times more cheering than if she'd blushed which people often did around Vian. Even if he didn't care about hockey, he wasn't exactly bad looking. She lofted her omnic, giving it a waggle. Does that mean I can uplink the antler photos? Prettiest, please? Vian thought about the Tathika ions, Tom at Gladen, and the clusterfuck of greed, resentment, and petty corruption that had led to his borrowing Nojas's ship in the first place. Then, with careful ceremony, he popped the antlers back on his tussled head. Go hearts, he said, and smiled for Yoko's camera. So... There we go. That has been Foz Meadows reading to you from first an accident of stars and then secondly from my work in progress, the Janus game. I hope you've enjoyed that and I hope that this has been an enjoyable break from the lockdown, pandemic, plague, quarantine state in which we all find ourselves uh, and that you have a good rest of the evening if you're in the UK or day if you are in the US. 
or you know just time if you're somewhere else <laughs> time has no meaning at the moment that's fine um also before i go here is a cat its name is baby and it has no bones please enjoy his dumb squished face all right thanks everyone bye